Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's an extra long sermon today, so I'm just kidding. Um, we, are, we are doing something a bit different. I think you'll understand why in a little bit. But uh, we're going to spend some time in the Word together, and then we're going to sing and worship uh, in response to what we've learned. And so uh, we'll kind of flip-flop things a little bit today, but uh, hopefully it'll be an encouragement to you and glorifying to our Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 8. 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 22. And it came about, when Samuel was old, that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, And came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, your sons have grown old, and your son you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people, in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked him a king. And he said, This will be the procedure of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in chariots among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint himself commanders of thousands, of fifties, and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your herds excuse me, the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give them, give to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now Samuel had heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you would guide us with your Holy Spirit as we look at your word together. Lord, I ask that you would teach us and instruct us. I pray that we would grow in maturity that our thinking and our believing and our behaving would fall more in line to conformity with Christ than it has before this moment arrived. Lord, our desire is to preach your word so that every man may be presented complete in Christ, lacking in nothing, equipped for every good work. And I pray that that work would be done today. I pray that you would Grow us and mature us and equip us with your word today. Father, please give us attention. Help us to pay attention. Help us not to be distracted by thoughts of other things. Father, we love you. I pray that we would submit our lives to you gladly and joyfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is not so much the what as it is the why that is the problem today. 
It is not so much that Israel wanted a king that is a problem. It's why they wanted a king that is the problem. The Lord has seen this day coming. In fact, the Lord planned for this day to come. The Lord is not taken off guard. He's not taken by surprise. Doesn't mean that it is not sinful for the people to ask in this way. But it's not the what that they are asking that's problematic. It is the why that they're asking. See, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20, we we see the Lord preparing Israel for the king. There will be a day when a king will come. You will ask for a king, and a king will be appointed from among your brethren. And the king is to function in a particular way. He is not to raise himself up with great riches and great many wives and a huge standing army. None of this. He is to be a man as an example of righteousness and faithfulness to the nation of Israel. He is to be a man who is, in a sense, to hold Israel in check. In fact, in Judges, which is the context of Samuel, we see that this repeated frame, there was no king in Israel, thus everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So a king, by implication, is meant to restrain the people from sin, which is a good thing. So why is it that the Lord seems to be upset with their request for a king? It's because it's not the what that's the problem, it's the why that's the problem. It's the motivation behind this. You see, the Lord planned for David to rise as king through whom Jesus would come. Jesus will be the ultimate king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is the one that that will come before the ancient of days and receive glory, dominion, and a kingdom over all the nations of the earth. This, This idea of kingship is not bad. It's the why. So what is Israel's motivation behind their demand to Samuel? What is it that they're after? What is going on here that causes this to be one of the dark moments in Israel's history? Well, very simply, it's idolatry. Idolatry. They are trading God for another. Look at verse 7. Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. Why? For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The motivation behind this request is a desire to exchange God for another, to trade God for someone else. They don't want to be led by divine authority any longer. They don't want God to be in control of their lives any longer. They would rather be submissive to another. They would rather look to another as their source of authority, as their source of provision, as their source of protection. You see, Israel, their history is is filled with this kind of ungodly desire. The the, the pattern of their life, look at verse 8. Like all the deeds which they have done since I brought them up from the land of Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Israel has developed this pattern of rebellion. They have developed this pattern of disobedience. This idolatry is like a gravitational pull that is constantly pulling them towards the black hole of destruction. This desire is like an insidious parasite on the human heart that will not let go. Despite God's mighty help against the Philistines just just years before this, just as God worked powerfully through Samuel's ministry to keep the Philistines out of the land of Israel, one would think the Lord is worthy of their trust and worthy of their dependence and worthy of their faith. Even if they go back further than that, the Lord has countless times delivered them through the hands of his judges, miraculously, wondrously, powerfully. The Lord conquered the land of Canaan and gave it to them on a silver platter. He knocked down the walls of Jericho on his own apart from their military engine. The Lord is a great warrior, the mighty king of heaven, and yet they they are preferring another. He is the, the mighty Lord who delivered them out of Egypt. And yet this insidious parasite of idolatry is always seemingly attached to their heart. Constantly pulling them and their allegiance and their loyalty away from the Lord and attaching it to someone else. 
They're willing to constantly trade God for false gods, false gods that they think will provide for them and protect them and nurture them. This parasitic worm in the human heart is a contemporary problem as well. It's not just something that Israel dealt with. I mean, have you ever had that moment of experience where you're like, sometimes I wish that I was an ancient Israel. I could just slap somebody upside the head and say, what is wrong with you people? Why do you not get it? Do you not see what God is doing? I mean, good night. If we could see God doing that, we would never sin again. But it's not true. We would be just like them. Look at Romans chapter 1 with me. Romans chapter 1. Because this is not something that just happened to Israel. It's something that happens to us as well. In verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. God's wrath, His judgment is coming because we suppress the truth. We hide the truth. We cover up the truth with unrighteousness, with sin. And why do we do that? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. The reason they're suppressing the truth is because they know the truth that there is a God who created everything. Nature and creation screams and sings and shouts from the highest heavens. There is a God who made all this. Only fools who say there is no God believe we evolved from slime. Creation tells us there is a God, a designer of intricate wisdom. We know that and we suppress that with tales of foolishness. We know that this God not only is the creator of all that is, but he is a good God, a righteous God, a pure God, because he has given us a conscience. The knowledge that this is wrong and this is right, where does that come from? If we're just animals... No, it comes from God, and yet we suppress that truth as well because we want to do what we want to do. Verse 21 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They've traded the glory of God for that which is not God. We constantly feel this gravitational pull to worship and to depend upon something other than God. Even though we know God is there, we do not honor Him as God. We do not give thanks to Him as God. We trade Him. The message of this text is very relevant. It was relevant for Israel standing in exile as they would have heard these words read to them and understood that idolatry is what led them to this point. It's relevant for us as well because we live by faith in the Word of God. We live by trusting in the Word of God, a Word that is unfailingly true. We trust in the character of God that is unwaveringly good. And yet we constantly wage war against the desires of our heart that constantly are telling us, no, there's something else you need to be provided for. There's, there's something else that gives you security. There's someone else that gives you joy. There's, there's something else you need to be content. We must constantly be on our guard against this insidious worm of idolatry masquerading in our hearts as practicality and common sense. You see, the elders, they came to Samuel out of concern for the nation. Oh, Samuel, frankly, you're getting old. We're afraid you're going to kick off here soon. And your sons are not good leaders. They're wicked men, just like Eli's sons. We need security for the future. And, 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 and lest we think that they were beyond using Scripture to cloak their idolatry, they, you don't remember that passage in Deuteronomy where it talks about there will become a day when we're in the land and we will desire a king. Well, that's the day. Today's the day. It's not what they were asking. It's why they were asking it. They wanted to make sure that they were going to be taken care of, but they were unwilling to trust God to take care of them. 
They were unwilling to depend upon the invisible God who demands they live by faith in His Word. Rather, we want the security of a standing army, a visible king, someone that we can see and trust. You see, this, this evilness in the heart, this parasitic worm of idolatry that is attached like a leech to our hearts is still present. There is, there is these preferences that we have that we will struggle and fight against from now until the day the Lord transforms us in glory. They're not going to go away, but we must put them to death. We must do everything we can to resist these And part of resisting is knowing them. One of the commentators I read this week said that this text is like a mirror of self-examination. This text shows us the heart of the Israelites exposed. And in doing so, we look at the text and we see our own hearts exposed. So let's look at the text together and let us see a couple of things. Beware of ungodly preferences. There's five of them. We see in this text, there's five preferences that we have that are ungodly, that are the, 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 the seeping fountain of sin. The first is we prefer human authority to divine authority. We prefer human authority to divine authority. In verse 5, they say, Samuel, you've grown old. Now appoint us a king like all the other nations. In verse 7, it says, the Lord said, listen to their voice, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. You see, the rejection of Samuel was offensive to Samuel. He was, he was frustrated, and rightfully so. I mean, it's a vote of no confidence. Samuel, we don't trust you anymore. We don't, we don't trust your leadership anymore. We, we, don't, we don't think you're going to lead us out of this and provide for us into the future. No, we're, we're ready for new leadership. We're ready for you to just to kind of retire and go your way and, and, and bring in the new leadership. Samuel takes this to the Lord, and the Lord shocks Samuel, I think, by his response. Listen to them. Appoint for them a king. Give them their desire. Sometimes the judgment of God, the discipline of God, is simply giving us what we've asked for. Because they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. Why does he say that? Because Samuel is not the king of Israel. The king of Israel is the Lord. Samuel is simply the Lord's mouthpiece. In chapter 3, verse 19, we see that the Lord caused all of Samuel's words to come true. Samuel was leading under the direction of the Lord. Samuel was leading the nation at the Lord's direction. The Lord was the king. Samuel was simply the guy that comes before the king and shouts the proclamations of the king. So when they say, we want a king, they're not saying, Samuel, we're, we're necessarily tired of you. They're saying, we don't want the Lord to be king over us any longer. We don't want to submit to his authority any longer. We don't, want, we don't want to depend on him any longer. We want a new authority. Unless we think that we are immune to this ungodly preference, we are not. We reject the word of God as authoritative for our lives as well. We prefer the opinions of men. We prefer the opinions of experts on marriage, human experts on marriage, human experts on parenting, human experts on human sexuality or anger or leadership or whatever. We, we prefer to hear what Dr. So-and-so says rather than the clear teaching of Scripture. Clearly, this man is more up-to-date. He's, he's studied and he's understood and he's got a PhD in, in, in psychology and he's got a, a, a 15 other doctorates. We, we need to listen to him. We oftentimes care more about what Dr. Phil says and what Oprah says than we care about what the Word of God says. We trust what some nonsense, the the nonsense that comes out of some movie star's mouth or some reality TV star's mouth simply because they're famous. What what credibility does that give them? They can get on TV and act like a moron and we think that they know everything? But we do this all the time. We think that what they say is right. We depend and prefer the opinions of human beings to the authority of God's word. The Bible is outdated, old, irrelevant. We may not ever say that, but we we believe that when we prefer the opinions of men. See, when the opinions of men conflict with the teachings of Scripture, which one do you choose? 
We, we elevate personal experience to a higher level of authority than God's Word. See, Pastor Sam tells people all the time, there's two ways to live. You can live with by taking your experience and submitting it under the authority of God's Word, or you can take the Word of God and submit it underneath your own experience. You only live one or two ways. So which way are you living? And many times we think, oh, God, God must make an exception in my case. My, my marriage is an exception because of my spouse. My children are an exception. You know, they're just trouble. They just have lots of disorders. They just have lots of problems. No, they're just sinful. We can, we can start living by submitting our, our experience and our lives and our ideas and our opinions to the, to the Word of God, or we can submit the Word of God to our opinions. Which is it going to be? We have a tendency to submit the Word of God to our experience. It's an ungodly tendency that is in our lives. And if, you do not make, if you're not aware of that, you're going to find yourself doing it again and again and again. You see, human authority panders to our desires. It tickles our ears. It makes us feel good about our sin. It's self-focused. It's void of human personal responsibility. So who are you listening to? Who are you paying attention to? We prefer human authority to divine authority. That's one idolatrous tendency in our heart. But another one is that we prefer sameness to distinctiveness. Look at verse 5. Appoint us a king like all the other nations. And in verse 20, we want a king like all the other nations. We want to be like all the other nations. We, we don't want to be different. We want a king like everybody else has. We don't want to be distinct. In essence, what they're saying is we don't want to be your holy people. We don't want to be your special people. We don't want to be your particular people. We don't want to be holy like you are holy. We want to be like everybody else. In Leviticus 19, the scripture says, the Lord tells us to be holy as I am holy. And then he gives all of these laws that we think are strange. The food laws, the clothing laws, the, the farming laws, and all of these things. And we think, what, in the, what is the purpose of all this? The overarching purpose of all of this is that Israel would be distinct from their neighbors. They're going to look different. They're going to act different. Their government's going to be different. Their, their religion is going to be different. Their morality is going to be different. Their marriages are going to be different. Their children raising is going to be different. Everything is going to be different. The way they treat slaves is going to be different. Their warfare is going to be different. You are going to be different because you are holy people. You are set apart for my purposes, to be a light to the nations. In Deuteronomy 7, the Lord says, you will be the envy of all peoples as they see in you people who trust in the Lord, people who have heard the voice of God. What other nation out there has a God who speaks to him? And the other nations will desire you and what you have. But in order for that to be the case, you must be holy. We tend to prefer that same thing, don't we? We want to be the same. We don't want to be distinct. We don't want everybody looking at us. We want to fit in. We don't want to be the, the, the weird ones. We don't want to be the ones standing outside the group. We want our morality to, to fit with the culture's morality. We want our politics to fit with the culture's politics. We want our marriages and our entertainment choices and our parenting skills. We want, we want, to, we want to fit in. We don't want to stand out here and have everybody look at us and say, why do you do things so differently? But that's exactly what's supposed to happen. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he says that they're going to look at you and wonder, why do you not run into excess with us? Why do you not sin freely with us? Why are you so different? It's because of Christ. Be holy as I am holy. In Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, the scripture says that the holiness of God's people is what makes the gospel attractive. We are to be the light of the world. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, didn't he? Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. But if we are blending with the world, they're not seeing our good works. They're not glorifying God. We prefer sameness. We don't want to be distinctive and different. We don't want to stand out from the crowd. But this is an idolatrous tendency, brothers and sisters. We must wage war against it. We must resist that gravitational pull. 
So we prefer human authority to divine authority. We prefer sameness to distinctiveness. But we also prefer control to dependence and patience, to faith. Verses 1 through 5, the people come and they say, Look, Samuel, you're about to kick the bucket. And your boys, they're terrible. We want, we want to make sure that before you kick off, we've got leadership in the back. We don't want to wait for the Lord to raise up a new leader. We don't want, we don't want, to, we don't want to go through that, you know, difficult stage of who's going, to, who's going to lead us, who's the Lord going to raise up. We don't want to live by faith. We don't want to trust God. We know God says he'll provide, but we don't want to do that. We want to guarantee. Elders wanted to make sure their future was secure. They want to live by sight, not by faith. And we have that same tendency as well. We prefer control. We don't want to wait for the Lord. We don't want to live by faith in his promises. We, we want to make sure the church grows the way we want it to grow. We want to make sure that our children turn out the way that we want them to turn out. We want to make sure our children take the direction that we want them to go. We, we, we want control. Some of us are control freaks. You cannot live by faith as a control freak. To live by faith means, God, you're in control and I'm not. I trust you. See, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 ought to be our motto. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to live that way? Because that's what the life of a Christian is. It is living by faith. The righteous live by faith. We live by faith in the sense that we are justified by faith. And we live by faith in the sense that we are sanctified by faith. The Christian life is not we get saved by faith and now we've got to work really hard. The Christian life is we're saved by faith and we live by faith in the promises of God. So we prefer human authority to divine authority. We prefer sameness to distinctiveness. We prefer control to faith. And we also prefer enslavement to a heavenly father. The Lord tells Samuel to warn the people about a king. King is not what you want. You ever told your children that? You don't know what you're asking. You're not going to want this. It's not going to turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. You're going to be miserable. And what do our kids do many times? I don't care. We did the same thing when we were kids. Part of being a parent is saying no anyway, right? That's part of being a father. But many times we don't want a father who says no. We don't, we don't want a father who disciplines us when we are wrong. We, we prefer to just be enslaved so that we, we don't have to have that influence in our life. See, they, they didn't want to have this deal where they had to walk in God's ways or face the discipline of the Lord and have to repent. It's too messy, too much. Let, let's just get a king. We'll have the security of the army and it'll all be taken care of. But Samuel warns them the king is going to take from you. Over and over from chapter or verse 10 through verse 18, he says it again and again and again. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your flocks. He's going to take your fields. He's going to take your vineyards. He's going to take your herds. He's going to take your produce. He's going to take your tithes. And at the end, you're going to say, oh, God, deliver us from this king because we have become his slaves. And the Lord's not going to listen to you in that day. We prefer a tyrant to a father. It's, it's easier in our mind to, to just have a box of rules we can see rather than a father who disciplines us. We don't want anything to do with discipline. We do the same thing. We submit to legalistic codes of conduct instead of submitting to a father. We build fences of... In, of instruction around God's word, fences of prohibition, turning traditions into laws, saying things are sin when they're not sin, rather than living by faith in the instructions of God and trusting God to discipline us and to guide us. 
We think that by our system of rules and do's and don'ts, we've turned Christianity into a a religious do's and don'ts system. And we think that if we live inside this little box and we don't don't ever step outside of the box, then we'll never sin and, and thus we'll be good. We're trusting in our own righteousness. Now, I'm not saying we go and sin freely. I'm saying stop living in the box of legalism and live in the freedom that Christ has purchased for us in Calvary. Live in the freedom that you have a Father who will discipline you so that you will repent and you will recognize, oh, that is sin. He instructs us as we live and as we grow. That's the way the Christian life is meant to be lived out. All of these boxes that we put ourselves in don't do any good. Look at Colossians, Colossians 2, verse 20. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is if you were living <clears throat> in the world do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Which are, all profess- which are all things destined to perish with the using in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and of self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Legalistic laws have no value against sin. Why? Because they deal with the external and they don't deal with the heart. A father comes in and deals with the heart. Why did you do this? Some of the times when I'm most convicted is when I'm having to discipline my children. You know, you've told your children, don't do this. If you do this, this is the consequences. And they do it anyway. And you look at them like, what is wrong with you? Why why do you keep doing what I've told you not to do? And the the consequence is always the same thing. And in those moments, as the Spirit of God convicts me, you do the same thing to me. But that's part of the fatherhood. He's teaching us. He's growing us. We don't need this box of legalistic rules because we have a Father who loves us, who instructs us, who disciplines us, all for our good that we may share in His holiness. So we prefer human authority to divine authority. We prefer sameness to distinctiveness. We prefer control to faith. And we prefer a tyrant to a father. And finally, we prefer practical and tangible mechanics to faith in God's promises. In verse 20, the text says they want to be they want a king like all the other nations who will go and judge us and who will go out before us and fight our battles. That's a striking statement. Who was it that went before Israel and fought her battles? It's the Lord who knocked down the walls of Jericho, who sent hail from the heavens and killed more of the army than the Israelite swords. Who was it that parted the Red Sea and decimated the army of Egypt? Who was it that sent nation after nation after nation in flight? Who was it that thundered against the Israelites in just the chapter before this? It was the Lord who fought their battles. But they're saying, we don't want that anymore. We don't, we don't want to live by faith in an, in an invisible God and in a promise. We just want to see our security. We, we want to know by sight. We want a king with a standing army. And we do this too. We prefer human methodology when it comes to church growth or evangelism or missions. We trust our schemes and our programs and our activities. We we trust our memorized tracks. Why are we so loath to trust in the power of God? You see, I don't know that we are. We are because we don't pray. Our prayerlessness is directly proportionately related to our faith in the power of God. We're so confident in our methodologies. We're so confident in our sermons. We're so confident in our human activities that we don't trust God. We ought to be on our knees crying out to God to save Macon. We ought to be crying out to God to revive our church. But we're so confident in our methodologies that we don't pray. Our prayer meetings are the most poorly and pathetically attended meetings of this church. Many of us are working in J-12 or in crossover. Or you can't come to the Tuesday morning prayer meetings because of your job or whatever. But, But there ought to be a time where you can get together and pray with God's people. When you pray with your family, how much of our prayer time as our family is devoted to the salvation of the souls around us? Or do we pray just out of rote? God help us sleep good tonight. I know I'm guilty of it. Our prayers are just at mealtime. Or just at bedtime. 
But they're not earnest, focused, disciplined prayers. How many of us get on our knees and pray earnestly for lost people by name? For church people that don't faithfully come to church, pray for them that God would restore them. How much time do we spend praying? Our prayers are proportionately related to our trust in the power of God. We don't pray because we think it's more dependent upon what we do than what God does. Brothers and sisters, these these parasitic worms are attached to our heart. These preferences for human authority to divine authority, to, to sameness rather than distinctiveness, to control rather than faith, to tyrancy rather than fatherhood, to, 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 to this methodology rather than the power of God. Oh, that we would not be stubborn. Beware of the stubborn foolishness like these Israelites. What do they say? Samuel, who speaks for God, And God has never let one of Samuel's words fail. Never. So they, he's got a good record of of prophecy. What he says happens. And Samuel says, you're going to hate this. You're going to hate it. And the Lord is not going to hear you when you cry out in your hatred of it. No. We want to be like them. We want the king. Beware of such stubborn foolishness that becomes so fixated on what you want in the moment that you refuse to heed wise counsel from those who know more than you. How many times have you been neck deep in sin in your life and the people around you, the people that are closest to you, the people that care the most about you, the people that are your parents and your Sunday school teachers or your pastors or, or your deacons or, or, or godly people in your life and they're telling you you're making a mistake. This relationship is a mistake. This activity is wrong. What you're doing, you're going to regret. And we have the audacity to say, nobody understands me. You don't understand what I'm going through. The reality is you're the only person that doesn't understand what's going on. You see, our sin blinds us. Makes us see things colored so that everything comes out tinted. Listen to those who love you, who know the Lord, and who give you godly counsel. Don't be stubbornly foolish like the people of Israel. And beware that you refuse to heed the counsel of God's word. There's so many times we just dismiss sin as if it's okay. There's exceptions for us. We, we justify our sin. We justify premarital sex when we're teenagers. We, we justify divorce with our spouse. We justify gossiping at the coffee shop. We justify bitterness rather than forgiving. We justify our lack of submissiveness to our husband. We justify our lack of love for our wives. We justify poor parenting as parents. We justify disobedience to parents because they're not godly parents. We justify our sin day in and day out. And we're being stubbornly foolish like these people. We're allowing that parasitic worm of idolatry to work its way into our mind and draw us, gravitationally pull us away from the Lord toward idolatry. Brothers and sisters, heed the wisdom of God. Heed the wisdom of God. Submit to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what this text is about. Israel rejected God as king. May we never do that ourselves. He is king. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is king, whether you acknowledge it or not. And we as his people must kneel before him in glad-hearted submission. He is our father, but he is our king. Are Are we trading our king for another king today? In just a moment, Pastor John is going to come and, and lead us in singing. And, and this, this time of singing is a time of, of worship. It is a time of response, but it is the beginning of worship. It is us crying out to God, you are king. You are Lord. You are master. And I will submit to your authority. And I will wage war against these parasitic worms in my heart. But it doesn't end here. You see, all of life is worship because worship is living in humble submission to the Word of God. 
So as we leave this place, we leave singing the praises of our King of kings and Lord of lords. And we go out submitting and obeying our King of kings and Lord of lords. Brothers and sisters, let us not be foolish. But let us heed the wisdom of God's word and submit to our King. Let's pray.